सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली लेट अस सेट अप दिस एपिसोड ऑफ करता क्लटर विद ए फोर क्वेश्चन क्विज कॉन्टेस्ट एंड दीज आर फोर क्वेश्चन विद ए हायर the hierarchy remember i didn't say hierarchy like this hierarchy like this so these questions have degree of difficulty in descending order because i know you are so smart i am sure by the time i ask you the third question if not the second you will figure out what we are talking about but let's go with the list anyway so the first question who do you think it's a familiar human being somebody somebody all of us are supposed to know about or are familiar with who among the people we've known achieved the most by the time the person turned 51 just 51 and left the most lasting impact with whatever the person did by the age 51 so that's the first question tough one second we know that it's military generals it's military officers who become chief martial law administrators do you know of any human being who became a chief martial law administrator of his nation while being a civilian a civilian right any civilians as chief martial law administrators think about it i told you second is easier than the first number 3 dynasty has suffered the most violence and also perpetrated the most violence of any that we know of in our in our environment dynasty we might be familiar with i told you first toughest second easier third still easier and the fourth which is the second most important dynasty in the subcontinent now i know it's a giveaway so you know that we are talking about the bhutto family and why are we talking about the bhutto family today because the 44th death anniversary or 44th assassination anniversary of zulfikar ali bhutto just passed us by it was on 4th of april 1979 that he was hanged or assassinated in fact there was also a book attributed to him if i am assassinated titled if i am assassinated so he was hanged as a result of a court judgment by zia ul haq but the fact is that the whole world knows that this was an assassination this was a judicial assassination by a chief martial law administrator or by a military dictator now zulfikar ali bhutto he he was 51 when he died he was born in 1928 he died in 1979 so 51 when he died think of what he achieved within that short life he broke his country he was primarily responsible and there is enough history to convince us of this he was primarily responsible for the break up of pakistan he was also primarily responsible for the rebuilding of pakistan right so the same man breaks up his nation the same man rebuilds his nation also while in more recent times we might have thought of abdul qadir khan etc etc but the real parent or father of the pakistani nuclear bomb is zulfikar ali bhutto that is a quest that he started in late 50s he began thinking about it then he took it forward in mid 60s as he became more prominent in pakistani politics even in the 50s he had identified the scientist who was going to do it munir ahmed khan and he and he stayed with him right through in fact when he set up the pakistan atomic energy commission he made munir ahmed khan the chief munir ahmed khan used to work as a government scientist in the 50s then went to iaea in vienna but bhutto had him within his eyesight and when he became president after the breakup of pakistan the first thing he did was to start building the nuclear weapons program so again the father of the pakistani nuclear weapons program then what is the other thing he did if you think this is not impactful enough he is somebody who converted his country which had had fairly free economics until then and that's the reason pakistani economy was doing very much better than india's forget east pakistan because that was deliberately ignored and deliberately exploited but west pakistan's economy was doing very much better than india's because pakistan had free economy much freer than in india he came in and he brought in a socialist storm in fact one of his first actions 
within two weeks after taking over was to nationalize all the major industry, all of the major industry in Pakistan. In fact, if anything, Indira Gandhi followed in his wake and Indira Gandhi did that over the next two or three years. He did it all in one go. And while he was a very wealthy man, in fact, his family had inherited, according to various estimates, but credible estimates are, a quarter million acres of land in Sindh. Now, not all of it great ir irrigated land, but a quarter million acres of land is land. So he was one of the biggest feudals, but he also abolished feudalism and he also imposed <coughs> land sealing. Of course, it didn't apply to himself. That's how so socialists work everywhere. So he's the one who brought in this kind of aggressive socialism in the subcontinent. He was a very fiery speaker. In fact, if you listen to some of his earlier speeches, all his speeches tell you that he's a socialist, polemicist and a populist. So he did that, but he built the bomb for his nation. Then he was known to be, his pretense was a secular internationalist. But he's the one who, where he founded his party, Pakistan People's Party, in 1967, he said his slogan was, Islam is our faith, democracy is our polity, socialism is our economy, all power to the people. So, an Islamist, a populist, a nationalist, and the original India hater in Pakistani politics. Remember, he's the one who talked of launching the Thousand Year War, something that his daughter, when she was Prime Minister in 1990, she said, she also talked about a thousand year war. That is what got a response from VP Singh, who otherwise was very, very careful to mess with any of these provocations. He said in our Lok Sabha that those who talk of thousand year wars should reflect on whether they can last a thousand hours in a war, right? So the basic fact is that Bhutto it was who set up this very strong anti-Indianism. The idea that only one country out of, out of the two can survive, Pakistan, or India. He's also somebody who evangelized a nuclear weapon in Pakistan, if I can use the term evangelized in an Islamic country. In fact, he began working on the bomb, as I told you, late 50s onwards. So 1978, he was on the death row in jail, facing almost a certain prospect of death. And he had gone through what he described as a barbarous trial. Then a message came out of him. That was the time when it became evident globally that South Africa had also acquired a nuclear capability. By the way, I'm just leapfrogging. When South Africa gave up apartheid, that was also the time that South Africa's outgoing apartheid government gave up its nuclear weapons and nuclear capability. Anyway, going back to 1978, Bhutto in jail, when news came out that South Africa also had the bomb now, the word went out from jail on his behalf that Christian, South Africa, Jewish, Israel and Hindu India. These civilizations had acquired the bomb and it's a matter of time before the Islamic civilization will also acquire the bomb. In fact, he said Islam cannot remain without it and this is about to change. Now you said socialist, internationalist, secular, modern. So the party he founded, which his son-in-law that is Asif Ali Zardari and his grandson Bilawal Bhutto run now that still swears by the same internationalism, liberal, socialism, etc, etc. But he is the one who organized the second OIC conference in Pakistan, in Lahore in 1974. The idea was to get Islamic countries together, basically to remind them that one Islamic country had just been humiliated by a Hindu nation, by quote unquote a Hindu nation, and had lost half of its land and half of, more than half of its people and this was a humiliation of the Islamic world and try and raise money and support for his nuclear weapons program. For a man to have achieved so much, good or bad, in my book, more bad than good, obviously I, I committed from an Indian point of view and I know that he has a large fan following in Pakistan that his party gets a lot of votes, also it's the number three party now and sort of declining. But yet, I would say he's done more damage to Pakistan than many other Pakistanis. In fact, as much damage as Pakistani dictators. Because you know what? When he took over, he took over on 20th of December 1971. That was just after Pakistan had lost the war. And soon enough, he's the one who also put Yaya Khan under house arrest at a time when he suspected 
that a bunch of army officers were planning a coup against him. In fact, funnily, when this story came out in 1973, 59 army officers were arrested on the allegations that they were planning a coup to overthrow Bhutto. The court of inquiry that is set up or the tribunal that is set up, who is the officer, who is the military officer who chose to head the tribunal? It was a brigadier called Brigadier Ziaul Haq, who he later made chief on the heads of many others. He had locked up Yahya Khan, he had got him out, he became president, he took over power from Yahya Khan and he declared himself chief martial law administrator. I told you, this is a rare case of a civilian, perhaps the only one that we know, definitely the only one in the subcontinent, the only civilian to have become a chief martial law administrator. That's how he started. Then he came up with a new constitution in 1973, which still endures. So I told you, so much was achieved before the age of 51. So when he gave the new constitution to Pakistan, he was only 45 years old and that constitution still endures. In fact, even now, all the fight in Pakistan is about protecting and restoring the 1973 constitution. Now to achieve so much by the age of 51, you should have started very young and started very well. So Bhutto had very good education. He was born in a very elite family. His father, Sir Shanavas Bhutto, he was the Diwan of Junagar. For a very brief moment, he became like the big boss of Junagar and he is the one who first said that Junagar will accede to Pakistan in 1947. 15th August 1947. That happened and that's a complex history. The Hindus of Junagadh, it was a Hindu majority state. They rebelled, Indian forces went in and that matter was sorted out and Junagadh remained a part of India. But his father and he and the family left Pakistan very bitterly. Before that, he had gone to college and school in Mumbai. In fact, he had gone to Cathedral John Cannon and St. Xavier's and then he went to University of Southern California, Berkeley and Oxford. So he had top education. He also taught at University of Southampton for some time. He also was called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn. So he was somebody who achieved a lot academically very early in life. And by 1957-58, when he was just about 30, he had joined the cabinet of Pakistan. When he joined the cabinet of Pakistan, this was under Sir Iskandar Mirza or Major General Iskandar Mirza, who was the Governor General and then President of Pakistan. This didn't last very long. Very soon Ayub Khan carried out a coup and threw out Iskandar Mirza. Iskandar Mirza, by the way, he was a Bengali. He was a descendant of Mir Jafar, who's widely seen in our history and folklore as a traitor of the Battle of Plassey. He was the great grandson of Mir Jafar. At the age of 30, Bhutto took over as Minister of Energy, Petroleum, etc. in that cabinet. It continued on with Ayub Khan. In fact, it was at that point that he got in touch, that he came in contact with Munir Ahmad Khan and started thinking about a Pakistani nuclear program because all of them were hearing about India moving towards its own nuclear program. That was the age of Homi Baba, Bikram Sarabhai and their teams coming up in India. By 1963, again think of his age then at the age of 35, by 1963, Ayub Khan had made him Foreign Minister of Pakistan. At that age, he was hobnobbing with Shaman Lai, Mao Zedong. He famously negotiated the settlement, quote unquote, settlement with China, whereby Pakistan gifted Shaks Gum Valley. Obviously, India considers its own, its territory in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, a butting Siachen glacier, which Pakistan gifted away to China and quote unquote, settled its borders. That was done by him. And then he did many other things that you would not expect a 35, 36, 37 year old to do. Among the things he did, and I said good and bad, among the things he did was to drive his country into a war in 1965, which he was sure his country was going to win. So he's the one who persuaded Ayub to launch Operation Gibraltar in Kashmir that entailed sending about 10,000 infiltrators into Kashmir, mostly Pakistani army regulars dressed in mufti, hoping that Kashmiris will rise in revolt and Kashmir will fall in Pakistan's lap. That didn't happen. We know that story. Lal Bhagavad Shastri decided to expand the war into the plains of Punjab and then there was a stalemate and Tashkan the court which in Pakistan was greeted very bitterly. Why? Because in Pakistan, a mythology had been sold at a popular level. Which, and what was that mythology? That Pakistan had decisively won the war and had crushed India. So if you won the war and crushed India, why are you then just exchanging prisoners and 
capture territories on both sides and making promises of peace. So he used that to get Ayub out of power. By 1967, Ayub was gone. Yahya Khan was then moving in. The new general, 1970, the election was held in Pakistan, the first real election. He got the largest number of seats. He, he, he made a party of socialists. He got the largest number of seats in West Pakistan. But in East Pakistan, Mujibur Rahman's party, Awami League, swept the election and had enough seats to get a majority in the national parliament. That he did not want. He was under no circumstances, no matter what democracy did, although he said we believe in Islam, democracy and socialism, whatever democracy did, he wasn't going to let a Bengali become the Prime Minister of Pakistan. And that is what led to the crackdown in East Pakistan on 25th of March 1971, leading to the war later in that year and creation of Bangladesh. So historians have different views and historians blame various people and various leaders, including Yahya Khan, for the creation of Bangladesh. Yahya Khan was the President of Pakistan and Chief Martial Law Administrator under whose orders the army carried out those atrocities in East Pakistan and under whose command the army lost that war. But the fact is that if you see history, it was Bhutto and his politics and ambition that caused it. Yahya Khan, he was detained by Bhutto on the charges of trying to plot a coup against him. After Zia carried out a coup against Bhutto on 5th of July, 1977, Yahya Khan was released. On his release, he said, and I quote him, it was Bhutto, not Mujib in Pakistan. His rejection of Mujibur Rahman's six-point charter, his stubbornness, all of this riled up the Bengalis and the country broke up. So we've now given you a quick and abridged balance sheet of a remarkable person's life, of a remarkable life, who achieved so much, achieved by the age of 51. So for somebody who died a violent death at 51, it's a lot of achievement lot of achievement of lasting value, of lasting impact, particularly also given the fact that last two years of his life, he just spent in jail not being able to do anything ex except some writing, which was smuggled out of there by his loyalists and his lawyers. But you know what? He created a legacy of violence that did not spare him and his family. It's continued to bedevil his dynasty as well. So he formed the second most important dynasty in the subcontinent in the sense that the dynasty continues in the third generation and is still a dynasty of consequence in Pakistani politics, in Pakistani personal life. Even the current government in Pakistan is a government of two parties. The second major party there, the first is Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, Nawaz Sharif's party and the second is Pakistan People's Party which is now represented in the cabinet by his grandson who's the foreign minister and who just like his mother, his late mother and his grandfather speaks the nastiest lines on India. The line that Bilawal Bhutto has spoken about India at the UN and elsewhere, you haven't seen any other member of this ruling coalition including the prime minister speak in any place. So he continues on with that legacy. The fact however is that this dynasty has also suffered a great deal of violence. So just as we say in India, in India the Gandhi dynasty has seen two assassinations, Indra Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi. Okay, Sanjay Gandhi died early, but he died in an accident. Look at the Bhutto dynasty. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was killed at 51. His daughter Benazir was assassinated at 60. Of his two sons, one Shah Nawaz was killed at 26, obviously assassinated in Nice in south of France. The Killer could never be caught. In fact, his wife was under arrest, detention for some time by the French police. She was suspected. The Pakistani media, which was controlled by Zia ul at that point, said that he died of, a, died of a drug overdose. But nobody quite knows how he died. But he was assassinated at the age of just 26. And his brother, Murtaza, was then killed at the age of 42. Again, assassinated. Although the pretense was that he was killed in a police encounter in Karachi. So at least on that unfortunate metric, you could say that this is the most remarkable dynasty or the number one dynasty in the subcontinent because it has suffered the most violence for any other. Now before I let you go, since we are talking about the Bhutto dynasty and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, among the most quoted, the most famous or in or infamous lines of Bhutto, in fact there is competition, thousand year war and the second one is, we'll eat grass, but we'll make the bomb. So I'll go by the second one. We'll eat grass, but make the bomb. Because Pakistan did take that route. What's happened with Pakistan? Pakistan got the bomb 
But today there is a situation where you see these riots at centers where free wheat flour is being distributed. So I'm not saying people are eating grass, but this also underlines the perils of building your ideology, your foreign policy, your strategic outlook, but more importantly, your domestic electoral politics, populist policy politics, also a single point negative agenda. In this case, anti-Indianism and this relentless, insatiable urge to take revenge on India. We'll eat grass and make the bomb, a thousand year war with India. These endure because these are so polarizing for us in India as well. But remember, one more slogan that he created also carries on sort of in an everlasting way. And that is Roti Kapra Makan. So he defined his socialism in terms of Roti, Kapra or Makan. That is food, clothing and shelter. And that is something which found a positive buzz in India as well. So even during Mrs. Gandhi's socialist days, that was the slogan. And whatever generation you are, you might remember that there was a film, big super hit film that Manoj Kumar made that was called Roti Kapda or Makan on a similar theme in early 70s.